Welcome back to this edition of Beyond Addiction. My name is Adrian Webster. And uh, in our previous sessions, we had just wrapped up with a little subsection in the Beyond Addiction series dealing with the socially acceptable drugs. In this session, I would like to take you and begin the journey into another subsection dealing with the illegal drugs. And so I've uh, entitled this lecture, Chemical Weapons, Identifying the Enemy, Part 1. You know, there's a lot of talk in our world today about terrorism and the war on terror and all the rest. And I thought to myself, you know, why is it that drugs are not seen as an act of terror on our neighborhoods, on our churches, our societies, our homes? Maybe if we saw uh, the war on terror as including uh, combating the substance abuse problems, we might have a lot more re resources and a lot r more resolution to combat this problem indeed. And I'd like to introduce this topic with a little friend of mine in the form of a cartoon. It's Charlie Brown and Linus. They're walking down the road together, and Charlie Brown, who represents the successful, well-made man, you know, he's arrived, as it were, he's got it all together. And then you get Linus, who's really quite the opposite. He's really battling, he's got a little dependency problem, he's always carrying that blanket around, he's insecure, he can't do anything without that blanket, it's his, it's his safety net, so to speak. And Linus and Charlie Brown are having a conversation, and Linus outlines his philosophy on life to Charlie Brown, and he says, I don't like to face problems head on. I think the best way to solve problems is to avoid them. This is a distinct philosophy of mine that no problem is so big or so complicated that it cannot be run away from. Isn't that the way a lot of people like to face the problem of addiction, or shall I say, not face the problem of addiction? Is it not true that many people think uh, of the ostrich mentality, if I just bury my head in the sand and I can't see the problem, or make as if I can't see the problem, the problem won't see me and it won't affect me? Do we not, when our children get involved in addiction, try and just you know, console ourselves by saying, ah, it's a phase, they, they all uh, go through this, they all have to experiment at some point, they'll grow out of it. Many don't grow out of it. Many, is, uh, many have their lives taken prematurely because of the problem of addiction. Addiction is not going to go away by ignoring it, friend. It's not going to go away by, by, by making as if it's not there. Addiction will grow over time. And the sooner we confront the problem, the better for everybody involved. The first type of drugs, classification of drugs, that I'd like to talk about are the over-the-counter medicines. Anything that, as we've said in a previous episode, anything that is a painkiller, an antidepressant, or an appetite suppressant, or a trank tranquilizer, or anything along those lines, have potential for recreational abuse. After all, when you consider drugs in the opiate family, like the codeine, the morphine, the heroin, what are they? They are painkillers. The opiates uh, produce analgesia or a sense of pain relief. And so these drugs which are on the street are illegal drugs like, like uh, uh, heroin or morphine if it's used out of context and so on. Codeine, taken from medicines as we'll see, are painkillers and therefore fall under a, a classification of drugs which are legal and legitimate under certain circumstances with prescriptions in certain cases. But I've included them in this discussion because when they're used in the wrong way, they can have serious consequences in terms of addiction and side effects. The first one that I'd like to tell you about is a drug called Thins. Now, it may be sold under a different name in a different country, but the active ingredient in Thins is pseudoephedrine. It's sold as an appetite suppressant, as a weight loss formula. And by the way, a starvation diet is a bad way to try and lose weight. If, if, if you are trying to lose weight by restricting your eating habits, and I'm not talking about choosing the right foods, I'm just talking about not eating. That is a bad way to lose weight. It's not going to last. And when we take these sort of appetite suppressant chemicals, that's all we're doing. We're simply shutting down that center of the brain which says, hey, I'm hungry, I need to eat, and we go into starvation diet mode. There's a better way to lose weight, friends, but this is not it. So pseudoephedrine is the active ingredient. It is, in the country of South Africa, a Schedule 6 drug, which means you cannot get it without a prescription. Now, when I was younger and I had run out of money for drugs, I would send my girlfriend into the pharmacy and she would go in and she would buy this drug called Thins. We would take inordinate amounts of the drug and the pseudoephedrine would have a, a very similar effect to that of uh, amphetamine or methamphetamine. And so this was a cheap man's speed, if I could put it that way. 
Another drug you need to be aware of is a drug that's called Adcodol. Active ingredient is codeine at 10 milligrams and caffeine at 45 milligrams. There you'll remember in a previous episode how we spoke about caffeine and now it's in so many different types of drug medications. Here is another example, 45 milligrams. That's a, a little bit less than a, a cup of coffee, for instance. It is a Schedule II drug in the country of South Africa, which means you do not need a prescription for this drug. It is basically a painkiller. It's taken for anything from headaches to menstrual cramps to muscle pain, whatever it is. And of course, codeine, being part of the opiate family, is a very effective pain reliever. Well, when taken in inordinate amounts again, it creates a very similar experience to that of, that of ecstasy. Another drug which is often abused in this way is Sinutab. Sinutab, one side of the pill, is codeine-based again. You'll find codeine coming up again and again and again. It is a Schedule II drug, again meaning that you probably do not need a prescription to get it in your hands. Then we go on to a drug called Paracodin, which is actually a cough mixture, cough syrup. Codeine at 12.1 milligrams, and it is a Schedule VI drug, which again means you cannot get it without a prescription. Then we get Fiseptin. Fiseptin also a cough syrup. You'll find cough syrups coming up again and again. And its active ingredient is methadone. Now methadone is the drug that medical professionals and doctors will administer to people who are trying to get off of their heroin. So they're going through withdrawal and to ease the withdrawal symptoms, they'll give them methadone, which is apparently less addictive and, and, and not quite as powerful, but which is supposed to uh, you know, ease the pain and the cramping and the discomfort associated with going cold turkey off of heroin. Well, this cough syrup contains methadone. Drugs are medications, medications are drugs, and so methadone is, uh, is in this cough syrup. It's a Schedule VI drug, and uh, so often heroin addicts who uh, are still looking for something to play with will get hold of this medicine, either just drink it out the bottle or uh, heat it up and get rid of the, the additives and so on and end up with a more concentrated form of the methadone. Then there is Fencidil, again, a cough syrup. Fencidil has active ingredients of codeine at 9.4 milligrams and ephedrine at 7.2 milligrams. And it is a no-schedule drug, so you can go in and buy it, no questions asked. Uh, and so you can see some inconsistency in the way we are medically scheduling these drugs. Some drugs contain exactly the same thing in the same doses or more. They are not scheduled. Then other drugs which contain the same thing, sometimes in lesser dosages, and they are scheduled. But the problem is it's the same substances, sometimes controlled, sometimes not controlled, and that opens the way for abuse. And then, of course, there's a drug known as Empicod. contains 20 milligrams of co codeine. Now, codeine, you'll notice in all the others, we're sitting at 10 milligrams, 12.1 milligrams, somewhere around there. This is an extremely high dosage of codeine for a drug that is not scheduled. No schedule on this drug, 20 milligrams of codeine per pill. That is a very, very high dosage. So what are we saying, our friends? Drugs are medications, and beware, because medications can become drugs. We want to make sure that if we are keeping these drugs in our house, we know how much they are so that we can pick up if anybody's abusing them. We want to make sure that they're locked away in a safe or something like that. We want to take the necessary precautions, and if you have to take it for some reason, then you, first of all, limit when you take it. To don't just take it all the time, and realize that you're opening yourself up for the risk of addiction and its consequences. So we want to be careful about the over-the-counter medications. Remember that drugs are medications and that medications are drugs. So we want to be cautious, friends. Going on to some of the more illegal drugs, the first one I'd like to tell you about is, of course, cocaine. Fancy name, benzoyl methyl echinine. Bet you haven't heard a call by that recently, but uh, that's its fancy name. And it is known on the street as cocaine, or as sea, or as coke, or as blow, or as powder, or as crack. Crack are the little rock forms uh, of, of, of uh, cocaine, and this is the form that is usually smoked. It creates a very intense high, uh, but a very short-lived high, and a uh, very addictive form of cocaine. That is the crack cocaine. It is method of administration. It can be taken orally. Now think about this. If you take a substance orally through the mouth, it's going to go down into the stomach. So where is the site of absorption into the bloodstream? Well, through the stomach lining, right? It's digested like any food would be and absorbed through the stomach lining. The second one is that it could be intra intranasally taken. What is intranasal? That's a fancy way of saying snorting. So it's ground up into a powder, cut into lines, and it's, it's sucked up into the nasal cavities. And in the nasal cavities, it's absorbed how? through the little blood vessels, which are very rich network of them in the, in the nasal cavity, and from there into the bloodstream and straight to the brain. Then it can also be taken intravenously. That's the one you think of. 
probably most easily when it comes to cocaine or heroin or some of these bad boys as they're sort of known as. And that is where it's injected directly into the veins uh, using needles. Another method is that it could be inhaled, which means what? That it is smoked. The fumes from that crack cocaine is smoked. It's taken down into the lungs. It's absorbed, therefore, through the little walls of the alveoli straight into the bloodstream and to the brain. Which are going to be the fastest methods of administration? Obviously, your injection, because that's going straight into the bloodstream, uh, through the alveoli, the inhalation method, going to be very rapid, because if it wasn't that way, breathing oxygen wouldn't help you. The moment you breathe it in, within seven to eight seconds, it's there in the brain and uh, having its effect. And then, of course, intranasally is also a very fast method of administration. Within a few minutes, you're coming up. And the slowest of all, of course, is the digestion process where it's swallowed into the stomach. Before the Westerner came along and extracted and concentrated the active ingredient, the cocaine, to create this powder that we know, the native South American Indians were using this stuff as a, as a tonic. They would pick the leaves of the plant and make an infusion or a tea, or they would chew them as they were walking through the jungle. They would use them a little bit like the Westerner uses caffeine today. Of course, it's not uh, in a very strong and effective manner, but uh, just so that you know, the history of this product goes way back to even before cocaine as we know it today. And yes, drugs are medications, and medications are drugs. Even cocaine has a medicinal purpose. It is a fantastical, fantastic topical anesthetic. It's used in eye, nose, and throat surgery. There are, of course, other uh, options available these days, but certainly that is how it's still used in some circles and has been used extensively in the past. So, in fact, when we were young people and we were playing with this drug cocaine, one of the ways we would know whether we had gotten our money's worth is that we would snort the stuff and we, we would then uh, you know, see how fast and how effectively our face went dead. If we could, within a few minutes, uh, slap each other around you know, through the face and still call each other friends because we couldn't feel anything, then we would know that if we had taken a, a smaller amount of cocaine and this was the effect that our face went completely numb, that it was a high concentration of cocaine. If, on the other hand, you had to snort your whole gram or a whole lot of cocaine before you went sort of numb and dead, you knew that it was cut with a whole lot of other uh, substances. So cocaine, great topical anesthetic when it is used in a medicinal context. On the screen, you will see uh, the cocaine hydrochloride powder. This is the, the, the version that would either be cooked up into a liquid for intravenous administration or which would be cut into lines for snorting. And then you have the crack cocaine rocks, which uh, are, is the version of it that would actually be heated and uh, the fumes from that would be inhaled or smoked in through the lungs. Then some of the cocaine paraphernalia that you might be accustomed to seeing, or if you're not accustomed, that's why we put it on the screen for you. In case you see these telltale signs in a child or in a friend, what is all this stuff doing? What is the purpose of it? You know, teaspoons and needles and uh, all sorts of stuff that might be used for either cooking the stuff up into a liquid or for smoking it and the like. On screen now, you'll also see a woman who was photographed while high on cocaine. And throughout the series, I'll show you a few snapshots of people who have been uh, photographed while high on a particular substance so that you can get an idea, if you've never taken these drugs, as to the kind of vibe that's associated with each of the different drugs. You'll get a, you know, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. You'll get an idea of what sort of effects the drug is happening, having by having a look at the, uh, what you see in terms of the picture. So this woman here, high on cocaine, and what do you notice about her? Does she look high to you? No, she doesn't. Does she look like she's confused and dazed and bewildered? No, she doesn't. If she's pulled over by a cop because she was going too fast on the highway and he said, yeah, do the straight line test, walk in a straight line, I want to see if you wobble or stagger or fall over, would she pass that test? She probably would pass that test. Is she going to be slurring her speech and all the rest of it? No, she's not. So part of the purpose of showing these pictures is also to break the stereotype that's associated with what a drug addict looks like. This woman could be any number of successful women uh, well to do businesswomen in any of the major cities of the world. This, this, is, this woman is someone who you might be rubbing shoulders with as a colleague every day. And now you can see from this picture why, amongst the social elite, despite the high price tag of cocaine, it's very expensive per gram, still amongst the social elite, it's the drug of choice. Because they can go to their political parties, and they can go to their office parties, and they can go to their social get-togethers with their business colleagues. They can get whacked, they can get high, they can get energetic, they can get euphoric while not uh, getting into a state where they're dumb, where they're stupid, where they're making foolish decisions, signing away their millions, or making a fool out of themselves, or dancing on the table, or something else like that. Those would not be the characteristics of cocaine use. In fact, if this were your friend, and she came to you and said, you know, I, I need to borrow your car, can I borrow your car keys? You'd probably hand over your car keys, because you would say, there's nothing wrong with her, she looks normal. 
So what would the symptoms of cocaine use be? Well, typically a person will become very arrogant, very overbearing, very overly self-confident, sort of in your face, you know, I'm the king of the world, the world owes me something, very obnoxious and sort of overbearing, uh, not very nice to socialize with people who have done a little bit too much cocaine, but of course also a very dangerous drug with risk of overdose. Another drug I'd like to speak to you about briefly is a drug known on the street as ecstasy or technically named as 3,4-methylene-dioxy-N-methylamphetamine, MDMA as abbreviation. Now you will notice the last part of that name is methylamphetamine. Now you get amphetamine, which is known as speed. You get methamphetamine, which is known in the country of South Africa as tuk and in other countries as meth or crystals or whatever. And uh, these two are closely related. They are very similar, the same basic molecule, amphetamine. But the difference between amphetamine and methamphetamine is the addition of the methyl molecule to the amphetamine molecule. Why? Because the methyl molecule enables the amphetamine molecule to pass through the blood-brain barrier inside of the mind much more effectively. So it's the same basic substance, but it happens. the high happens quicker and more intensely. The amphetamine molecule is able to be utilized more effectively. And you'll notice that in the case of ecstasy, it also has what at the end? Methylene or methyl amphetamine. So it's part of the amphetamine family, methamphetamine, amphetamine, and methylene dioxy N methyl amphetamine. It's known as ecstasy, it's known as E, it's known as pills, or it's known as whatever the logo is that's on the front of the pill. So if you see on the screen there, you can see some little pills with a Mitsubishi logo. They would be called Mitsubishis. There are some little pills there with a dove on. They would be called doves. Now here's the thing. You'll notice that ecstasy pills come in different shapes and sizes, different colors, and each different pill with its different name has a reputation for creating a certain profile of effects. Per question is, if they're all ecstasy, why are they different colors? Are they just using food coloring to make the pills nice and pretty and good looking? Or is that ecstasy actually part ecstasy and part something else? Why is it that if it's all ecstasy, some ecstasy pills have a reputation for making you very dancey and energetic, while other ecstasy pills have a reputation for sitting you down and making you collapse? So why is it that they have these different effects if it's all the same substance? Well, while it's sold as ecstasy, it's not necessarily ecstasy. We'll come back to that in a little while's time. How is ecstasy typically taken? Well, it's taken orally, it's taken intranasally, or it's taken using a suppository. Now, you know oral and you know intranasal. That is, it's swallowed or it's, uh, the pill would be crushed up into a powder and snorted into the nostrils. What is a suppository? Well, a suppository is, to put it plainly, using the back door of entrance. So it's administered through the back door, so to speak, just like many medicines are administered that way, and then administered through that channel into, or absorbed through that channel into the bloodstream. Its effects, well known for euphoria. This is the number one reason why people take it, in fact. The euphoric effects. Ecstasy is one of those very touchy-feely, uh, love-type drugs, and so it creates a, a tremendous sense of euphoria. It makes a person very talkativeness, and it increases the sense of empathy and intimacy. You know, when somebody's on ecstasy, you just can't get them to shut up. They just go on and on and on and on and on and on. And everybody they think is their best friend and everybody else who's on ecstasy uh, reciprocates in the same way. It creates this, this atmosphere of, of unity, this atmosphere of family, this atmosphere of friendship. But it's a counterfeit because at the end of the six hours when the ecstasy wears off, what happens to all that friendship? It evaporates as fast as the drug is eliminated from the system. So it's not the genuine article. And you know what I wonder about to myself sometimes? I wonder if the reason ecstasy ecstasy isn't so popular in our world today is exactly because human beings have been designed at the core of our being to be relational. We have designed for meaningful relationships with one another and we live in a world that's broken. We live in a world of single parent homes. We live in a world of, 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 of brokenness and of betrayal and of distance from one another where we don't con connect with one another meaningfully anymore. We live in that kind of a society, yet we have not changed in our design plan. We need relationships. And I wonder whether, whether this drug has not taken the youth by storm because young people are looking for that connectedness with one another. And if we cannot get the genuine thing, we will get a chemically induced counterfeit, even if it only lasts a few hours. We all feel rotten afterwards. We all wish we hadn't done it afterwards. We all know we've told uh, our secrets that we shouldn't have afterwards. Uh, but at least for a little while, we're able to satisfy that God-given need for fellowship and for fulfillment. I remember when I got out of this drug world and I looked back at the 
big rave parties we'd been at and the ecstasy experiences and all the rest, I began to think to myself, all the lights and all the music and the celebration and the party environment and the sense of community and belonging, I began to think, isn't it possible that maybe what the rave scene is along with the drug scene is nothing other than a counterfeit of what God plans to give us in heaven? Is it possible that young people are selling out short-sightedly for what heaven is intended to be for us and they're going for the cheap counterfeit down here on earth? Let me tell you something. If you're one of those people, you want to get out of that world. It is the counterfeit. God has something much better in store just around the corner for us that we want to be ready for. You know, one of the differences between ecstasy, which is part of the amphetamine family, and the other amphetamine type drugs is this idea of increased sense of empathy and intimacy. While the other amphetamines will make you talkative and all the rest of it, this particular drug has this creating this community effect we've been talking about. Why? Because Scientists are sort of saying that it causes the release of oxytocin in the brain. Oxytocin is a neurotransmitter which creates a sense of bondedness between mother and child through the breastfeeding experience or between a husband and wife. I'm using that term, those terms very deliberately because the sexual relationship between husband and wife which creates that bondedness is only supposed to be enjoyed in that particular, in that particular context. And the oxytocin creates that bondedness between the two parties. And ecstasy seems to perhaps release this oxytocin, creating this false sense of community, which evaporates as fast as the drug is eliminated from the system. It intensifies the auditory and the tactile sensation, tactile, touchy-feely, so everybody's giving each other back rubs and massages when you go into the chill-out room at the rave party or in the club, because everything just feels so physically good while on this drug causes urinary retention, and this is a very torturous experience. You know you've got to go, but when you get to the bathroom, you stand there or you sit there for a long time, and, well, nothing happens. Torture. Abnormal pupil dilation, it increases physical energy levels, it increases heart rate and blood pressure, it causes short-term memory lapses, and you'll find this increase of heart rate and blood pressure a common theme that runs through just about all the drugs we'll talk about. It causes jaw clenching and teeth grinding, rapid uncontrollable eye movement, hyperthermia and dehydration. And this is the number one cause of death when it comes to ecstasy-related deaths. That people are dancing on the dance floor, they're taking pull after pull, they're not thinking about their bodily needs, they lose uh, sense of their needs, they're not drinking water, it increases blood pressure, it increases heart rate, it increases uh, the, the body temperature as it burns more energy, plus you're dancing and going mad on top of that, and eventually the body just gets to a point where it shuts itself down and one dies. Another form of death is serotonin syndrome, where, uh, of course, ecstasy works largely with a serotonin system inside of the brain, that neurotransmitter uh, network, and it causes too much serotonin to be released and be in that synapse across the brain at the same time. And the result is that it pretty much just cooks, cooks the brain, the brain shuts down, and one ends up dead as a result of overdose on the neurotransmitter serotonin picture here for you of a woman who is high on ecstasy. And you can see she's uh, looking very confident, very euphoric, uh, a little bit different to the woman who was on cocaine, who had a very sort of straight look about her. This woman is in another place altogether. Now on the screen there you see MDMA, methylene dioxide, uh, methamphetamine, hydrochloride crystal, crystals. And they are white in color. Notice that. When we look at the next slide, which is a picture of 99 different ecstasy tablets, you see them different uh, colors, uh, colors of the rainbow. And as we were saying earlier on, you just don't know when you buy ecstasy on the street whether what you're getting is ecstasy. So here's the risk. I buy ecstasy, I take it, I'm fine. I buy another one, take it, I'm fine. I take 50 pills, it's fine. I take my 51st pill and I drop down dead. Why? He took ecstasy so many times. Why did he all of a sudden die? Because you don't know what else is in there. You don't know the level of purity. You don't know what other drugs it's been cut with or what other, what other chemicals it's been cut with. Why do we cut drugs with other substances? Because it dilutes them. Thus, we get greater volume. And the greater volume you have, the more you sell. So it's all about economics. It's not about your personal hygiene or health. It's about your drug dealer's wallet. So we dilute these substances with other substances and we cocktail certain drugs to create various effects, and you just don't know. It's not like buying a medicine where you can tell the ingredients that are in there and the level of purity and they're being controls. When you buy it on the street, it's impure, it's cut with other substances, and you may react to a particular substance, and you end up dead. You thought you were taking ecstasy, but you just didn't know what was in that pill. Now, this is a very interesting graph over here, a very interesting picture. It's taken from the Journal of Neuroscience, 
And what you're looking at is sections A, D, and G are three different areas of a primate brain where the serotonin system is very active. You will notice that it has a, a very dense web of neurons. You can see what looks like little spider web white lines all over there. The denser, the better. That means we're seeing a higher density of, uh, of, uh, of serotonin using neurons. Well, they administered some ecstasy to this primate. And then they came back and they took a picture, B, E, and H. Same areas of the brain before, only what can you see? Much less density of neurons. This picture, those pictures were taken two weeks after the MDMA was administered. So they administered the drug, they come back two weeks later, take a picture of the same area of the brain, and you can see very clearly a, a, a loss of density, a loss of these neurons that should be reacting to and working with serotonin. What are we saying? We're saying that taking drugs can physically damage your brain. We're saying, yes, but, wait a second, somebody says, uh, I'm, I'm not a primate, I'm a human being. Can you apply the science? My question in response would be, are you willing to take the chance? Are you willing to take the risk by gambling with your brain? I don't know about you, but for myself, I know I could use more brain than what I currently have. I cannot afford to be wasting away brain cells every party I go to just for the experience of pleasure. So coming back to our picture here, pictures C, F, and I are photographs taken some seven years later. Come back, take a look, see if there's been recovery. Can you see some recovery when you compare it with B, E, and H respectively? Praise the Lord, yes, there has been recovery. There's a definite increase of density. The brain has been able to find healing. However, is it even close to the original? Very clear answer to that is no, it's not. What are we saying? We're saying it's not worth the gamble. We don't want to start playing with these drugs, friends, when they can, when, and, and risk ruining our brain and ruining our mind when we need every ounce of brain power that we can possibly muster. The bottom line is real simple when it comes to these drugs. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which you have and which is in you? It has been given to you from God and you are not your own. Do you understand what that's saying? You are, by divine right, you belong to God. He created you. He designed you. He put you together. And He gave you the blessing of a healthy mind and a healthy body. Who are you, the one who borrows this gift from God, to go around and at will vandalize the body temple, vandalize the mind? God has given you a mind and a body so that you can have relationship with Him. And second of all, you are His because He has purchased you a second time around. He created you the first time, and then after sin, He came down here in the person of Jesus. He died for your sins. He purchased you back. You are His on two accounts, by creation and by redemption. Your body, your mind, your everything belongs to Him. And we do not want to be maltreating the gift of life and the gift of this body that He has given us just for a few fleeting moments of pleasure. Friends, your brain is a marvelous organ designed with, with intelligence by the Creator's hand. Come forth in love as a gift to you. How ought you to treat this mind, to treat this body with the greatest amount of respect and reverence that you know? Friends, I want to offer up a word of prayer and ask the Lord that He will bless you as you consider these great choices of life, that you will choose to honor Him in all things. So let us bow our heads together. Heavenly Father, will you grant to the viewer the power for change? Will you grant to the viewer healing from whatever the challenges are that they have experienced in their life? Perhaps they're struggling with substance abuse or some other form of addiction. That brain circuitry, that brain neurobiology has been damaged. It's been unbalanced. But you are the God that, that created us and made us. You know how to put spare parts back together again. You know how to, to restore and to heal. And I ask for the one who's viewing now, for their family member or their friend who's upon their heart and their mind, that you will bless them with restoration and healing. For I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.